To understand Tom Uren's political career, which featured 32 years in parliament as the federal Labor member for Reid, the best place to start is at the end. When he retired in 1990, he was asked what he would do. Now he was no longer in politics. I'm out of parliament, Tom thundered, not out of politics. Tom's political power and influence came directly from his political conviction. Tom Uren was a man of substance. Tom was a true believer. He was a proud man of the left, straight left, as he named his wonderful autobiography. Political activism was a way of life, a responsibility. Over his long career, he pursued this responsibility with commitment, tenacity and absolute conviction. He could be a ferocious and fearless opponent. But just as importantly, he did so with a generosity of spirit and a willingness to work with anyone of goodwill to achieve practical outcomes. He was selfless in his struggle for justice, compassion and progress. If you look at photographs of some of the big people's political movements over a period spanning six decades, chances are you will see Tom on the front line. The Vietnam War moratoriums, the anti-nuclear movement, indigenous land rights, protection of our urban and natural environment, self-determination for the people of East Timor, justice for war veterans, uncompromising defence of civil liberties. If he was convinced that he was right, he feared nothing. Not criticism, not even jail. But then again, I suppose it's pretty hard to intimidate a bloke with the threat of an Australian jail when you've worked on the Burma Railway. Tom lived the vision of change outlined by Barack Obama, who once said, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. Tom was always seeking change, on the streets, at public forums, in the Australian Labor Party and in the parliament. He was immensely proud of his last major victory when he convinced Julia Gillard and the former Labor government to provide compensation for surviving prisoners of war. The great testimony to Tom's life as an activist is that he was on the right side of history on all of the major causes that he was associated with. When Tom and his great mate Jim Cairns led opposition to the Vietnam War, it was a radical proposition. It takes moral courage to campaign and bring people with you. After he was declared one of the 100 living national treasures in 1997, Tom joked that people applauding his lifetime of achievement would have had him hanged in the 1960s over these very same issues. There's a message here that we should never forget. Today's unfashionable cause can become tomorrow's conventional wisdom. Tom argued that if you believe in your heart that your cause is just, you should fight for it. And fight Tom did. Tom's parliamentary career began in 1958 in the seat of Reid after moving to Guildford with Patricia. In a hard fought pre-selection, he defeated a sitting member, Charlie Morgan, who he saw as being linked with the right-wing industrial groups. This was the first time that a sitting Labor MP had been successfully ousted for a long time. He didn't do it by stacking branches or calling upon favours from sympathetic trade union blocs. He simply argued his case and persuaded party members over cups of tea at their kitchen tables. He was persuasive, passionate, and of course, he could be charming. His conviction shone through, and I believe he was a grassroots campaigner without peer in our movement. While he was a strong supporter of collectivism through the union movement, it was the community that was his political support base. You couldn't walk down the street alongside him 
without feeling the warmth that people had for him. People truly loved him. Even his opponents respected him. After easily winning his seat, Tom spent his first two or three terms creating firm alliances with like-minded MPs. He worked hard to absorb knowledge from colleagues and books as he sought to make up for his lack of educational opportunities earlier in life. He taught himself the principles of economics and the fine detail of the full spectrum of Commonwealth legislative activities. Tom wanted to change the world and his tool was persuasion. His aim was incremental progress. He would always tell me, you've got to bring people with you. It didn't stop opponents questioning his patriotism. Tom responded with successful legal action. He built a place in the mountains called Fairfax Retreat. and a house down the south coast that he nicknamed Packers Lodge. <laughs> he had a bit of a view about Murdoch's role in the last election as well. <laughs> By the late 1960s, Tom was in a leadership role. Tom had a difficult relationship with Whitlam, worrying that golf might be too wedded to American foreign policy. But when Whitlam declared his intention to bring troops home from Vietnam, that cemented Tom's support. And if you had Tom's support, his loyalty was absolute. Gough Whitlam turned to Tom to design and later implement the nation's first comprehensive policy for improving living standards in our nation's cities, the outer suburbs and regions. In 1969, as man walked on the moon, millions of Australians watched the event on televisions in homes that were not even connected to sewerage, particularly those people in Western Sydney. Roads were inadequate. Public transport was underfunded. There were few protections for heritage values and the environment. Goff and Tom realised that if they worked with state and local government to provide political leadership and direct investment in communities, they could deliver real improvements in the day-to-day -day life of millions of their fellow Australians. Having spent their political lives aspiring to uplift mainstream Australia, they had hit upon a practical way to do so. Tom attracted the best and the brightest to the Department of Urban and Regional Development. More than 20 of these creative public servants went on to head government departments and agencies. Tom Uren's achievements in the Whitlam government stand as testimony to what can happen when national leadership and vision is put into practice. Growth centres such as Albury Wodonga, the provision of parks and environmental protection in suburban Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and other parts of Australia, the provision of sewerage in the outer suburbs of our capital cities, the direct funding of local government through financial assistance grants based upon a formula that targeted need so that those communities in the outer suburbs of our capital cities and our regions got the most funding. The first significant federal funding of public transport, the creation of the Australian Heritage Commission, the register of the national estate, the saving and rejuvenation of urban precincts like Glebe and Woolloomooloo, the protection of the Sydney Harbour foreshore. As much as Tom put collective action before the role of any individual, the truth is that one man did change the relationship that our national government can have in improving the quality of life, particularly for those living in our outer suburbs. That man is Tom Uren. <laughs> Tom became deputy leader to Gough Whitlam after the loss of government, defeating opponents, including his later very great friend, 
Paul Keating, who visited him uh, in hospital uh, during those last weeks. He continued to play a role in the executive right up to the 1983 election of the Hawke government, in which he joined Bill Hayden, Lionel Bowen and Paul Keating as the only Whitlam government ministers to also serve in Bob's government. As a minister in Bob Hawke's government, he took up where he left off, supporting public and community housing, cementing his position as the modern father of local government. As the Minister for Administrative Services, he oversaw the construction of the new Parliament House, which had begun with his motion on the floor of the old Parliament House back in 1975. Tom started the ball rolling on self-government for the ACT, consistent with his support for grassroots and participatory democracy. After he stood down from the ministry in 1987, he became Australia's delegate to the Interparliamentary Union, taking his message of peace, nuclear disarmament and social justice onto the international stage. He retired from Parliament as the father of the House of Representatives in 1990, but continued his political activism across a range of areas, including, including serving as head of the Parramatta Park Trust. Tom continued to be respected across the political spectrum. In 2012, uh, then Prime Minister Julia Gillard, then Opposition Leader Tony Abbott and then Greens political party leader Bob Brown combined to enthusiastically sponsor Tom's nomination for Australia's highest homegrown honour, the Commander of the Order of Australia. He had a great relationship with all three of them. To the very end, Tommy Wren was an optimist. He drew his positive outlook from people around him. Into his 90s, he said, and I quote, I hope that right to the end of my days, I'll always struggle for progress. Always have faith in tomorrow. Unless you've got faith in people, got faith in the future, then your life is not worth tuppence halfpenny and a beer bottle top. Tom lived by this positive creed until the end of his days on this land, which he respected and loved. Those of us who remain can honour his legacy by living by this creed. Tom once saw a musical show called Reedy River. It featured a singer named Christine Logan. And uh, as part of uh, that uh, theatre, uh, there was a version of the famous song, Ballad of 1891. Of course, from that point, Christine became his loving partner for the final decades of his life. Today, with this magnificent choir performing here, the men will be the shearers and the women will be the landowners. You're welcome to sing along. <laughs> 